I now want to cover the last topic in uh, regulation of gene expression. As I told you, transcriptional regulation of gene, gene expression is the normal way in which this process occurs, but there's a lot that can happen after transcription. Uh, even in, as you get into translation, uh, a protein, whether or not a protein is produced, is also dependent on what happens in translation. So all of these events that happen after the transcript is made, after transcription, we lump together as post-transcriptional regulation. And that's what I want to just summarize for you now. Before I, before I uh, get into that, let me point out that on your outline here, I have listed a series of events that we really already covered back when we talked about transcription. But you need to realize that each one of these events is a possible place where the regulation of gene expression can occur. And in some of these cases, we know that the regulation of gene expression occurs at those places. That is messenger RNA processing. When we originally make that pre-messenger RNA molecule in eukaryotes, it is not yet ready to serve as a messenger RNA. It has to go through a number of changes before it, it uh, leaves the nucleus and becomes a full-fledged, grown-up uh, messenger RNA. And so those messenger RNA processing steps are all potential places where the expression of the gene can be affected. And I've listed those for you. I've got them in little little bitty letters there indicating that you, you either have been or have, will be tested on that as a part of the previous outline. I'm just mentioning them here again and, and pointing out that each one of these is a potential place for the regulation of gene expression that happens after transcription, including the capping, adding the 7 methylguanosine cap. Remember that messenger RNA will never be translated unless it has that cap. So if whether or not you add the cap can affect whether or not that, that uh, uh, gene is actually expressed. Polyadenylation, again polyadenylation is necessary in order for translation to occur as we've already learned. And actually both of these events, capping and, and polyadenylation, are also necessary just for the stability of the, of the RNA molecule. So those are potential places for uh, regulation of gene expression. I'm going to give you one example of polyadenylation in just a little bit. And then splicing. If the molecule is not spliced properly, then it's not going to make up the messenger or the, make the polypeptide it's supposed to. And we've already seen an example of how this really affects the gene expression when I when we covered alternate splicing or alternative splicing. You can make a single pre-messenger RNA molecule, and depending on how it's spliced, you make polypeptide A or polypeptide B. So that's a, a very definite way in which regulation of gene expression can be controlled. And then those other events that I covered at the end of that section on translation, RNA editing, the RNA molecule may be modified itself, and if it's not modified properly, then you don't get the uh, proper uh, polypeptide produced. And then RNA degradation. Uh, if the RNA molecule doesn't stay around in the cytoplasm as long as it's supposed to, you're not going to get as much of the gene product produced. So I simply list these the, these the topics here, uh, RNA processing on the outline here, just to remind you this is also a potential for post-transcriptional regulation of gene expression. But now I want to talk about some new uh, uh, areas of post-transcription uh, uh, post regulation that we haven't talked about yet. One of these is the um, a, a case that's illustrated in the ferritin gene. The ferritin gene. Uh, the uh, you may have a case in which translation is actually blocked, uh, rather than blocking transcription like the relax repressor did. We may actually block translation. This is this is the case with the protein called ferritin. Ferritin is an intracellular uh, iron storing molecule found in pretty much all your cells. It's also a little bit found in the, in the uh, plasma, and your doctor tests your iron level. He may be testing the ferritin. One thing they can do is test the, the ferritin-bound iron. But this is, this is a pretty universal uh, uh, iron storage molecule. If you have a lot of iron that needs to be stored, you need to make a lot of ferritin. If you don't have iron to be stored, then you don't need to make uh, ferritin. So as it turns out, the, the translation 
of the ferritin messenger RNA is dependent on iron concentration. And the way that happens, as you see in the, in the uh, diagram here, the, uh, there is a region of that messenger RNA that is bound to by a specific protein. That protein that binds to the messenger RNA is called IRP. IRP for iron regulatory protein. There's actually two versions of it, IRP1 and IRP2 in humans. So that IRP protein binds to the messenger RNA. We're not talking about binding the DNA and turning off translation. We're binding to the messenger RNA. It binds to a region of the messenger RNA that's in that uh, five prime untranslated region. Not out there where the coding actually begins, but in the five prime untranslated region. And the region that it binds to is called the IRE, the iron response element. So as you see in this diagram, IRP, which is this protein, binds to IRE in the five prime uh, untranslated region of the ferritin messenger RNA. And in so doing, it prevents that small subunit of the ribosome from scanning down. Remember, it starts, it binds at the, uh, at the cap, at the 7-methylguanosine cap, and scans down until it finds the first AUG. Well, it's now blocked by IRP, and therefore, it, you, translation never stops, uh, never starts, excuse me. Uh, the translation never begins. So uh, IRP will actually block translation from occurring, and we're affecting the expression of the gene at the translational level post-transcriptionally rather than back at transcription. Now in the presence of iron, IR, in, in the IRP1 becomes inactive and IRP2 is degraded. So in the presence of iron, we don't have IRP bound to IRE and therefore translation is free to occur. So if you have iron, we're going to translate the messenger RNA and make the protein to store iron. If you don't have iron, extra iron floating around, then you don't need to make it and so IR IRP is bound to IRE turning off trans translation. So this is a case in which we're making the messenger RNA, but then whether or not the messenger RNA is actually translated into the protein is controlled at the translational level rather than the transcriptional level. Now this other diagram shows that there are other uh, repressors of uh, translation that do not bind to the 5' prime UTR, but actually bind to the 3' prime UTR. Remember that in in order to get proper translation, you have to have the 5', prime, you have to have the 5', methylguan, 5 methylguanosine cap on the 5' prime end, and you have to have the, the 3' prime uh, poly A tail. And that initiation process in eukaryotes involves both of those, and we covered that earlier. So you can actually, by having a protein bind to the 3' prime UTR, you can also turn off translation so the translation doesn't occur. So, so that happens in some cases. So this is a definite case of post-transcriptional. In fact, we would call this translational regulation of gene expression. There are other cases in which the regulation of, uh, of the translational process may result in a protein being produced locally in one part of the cell. That is, you have definite localization uh, of a protein produced in, in a particular region of the cell. This is most easily seen when you've got a great big cell, like, a, like an egg cell or something like that. And that's what this diagram illustrates to you. It's stained for the production of a particular um, a, a polypeptide. Um, and and uh, th th yes, th that's right. Uh, and, and you can see that that protein is actually I'm sorry, this, this is actually the messenger RNA. Uh, let me back up there. It's not, this is a staining for uh, the, the messenger RNA, and you see that that particular messenger RNA ends up being concentrated in one region of the cell, so that translation of that particular uh, messenger RNA is going to produce a protein, protein down in that one region of the cell. So there may be, it may not be a matter of turning on or turning off translation for the whole cell. It may be something to do with the localization of the messenger RNA to a re certain region of the cell so that that polypeptide is produced only in that region of the cell. Then the next example that I've given you here on the outline here is polyadenylation and changes in polyadenylation. The normal uh, history of a messenger RNA would be it's polyadenylated and you have these 200 or so 
uh, A residues uh, at the end of the three prime end of the messenger RNA. Therefore, it leaves the nucleus and it's translated. Well, there are some cases in which the messenger RNA, after it gets out to the cytoplasm, we actually remove some of those A sequences so that there's no longer 200 or so of them there. Maybe there's only 30 to 50. Uh, this, this one case in which this happens is in many oocytes, uh, cells that are getting ready to, be to become eggs. Uh, if you think about what an oocyte is and that oocyte as it develops into an egg, that egg is going to be just packed with information that's going to carry that cell through the early stages of development. Now, uh, it's it's pre-programmed really to, to, to go through uh, blastula and maybe even a little beyond that stage and uh, so all that information is pre-programmed into that egg before fertilization but you don't want those genes to be active just yet you're going to wait for the signal of fertilization as soon as fertilization happens then you want this burst of activity and the cells divides once and again and again and you just have differentiation beginning and so what happens in in these eggs is these messenger RNAs are pre-located out there in the cytoplasm in various regions they're they're pre-located in the in the cytoplasm and they're ready for translation to begin and to start making these proteins and to cause this uh, early de developmental processes to happen but they're inactive they become inactivated in many oocytes by removing part of that poly A tail. So those messenger RNAs get polyadenylated, they go out to the cytoplasm. After getting to the cytoplasm, they're depolyadenylated. They're, they're, as much of the poly A tail is removed, not all of it. You still have some 30 to 50 nucleotides or so, and it's just sitting there. It's, it has the poly A tail, tail, so it's stable. It has a short one. It's stable, so it doesn't get degraded, uh, but it's it's not being translated because you need that poly A tail for translation. Then, at the moment of fertilization, the 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 signals will actually stimulate the re polyadenylation of that tail, and with it, when it's lengthened again to the 200 uh, nucleotide length, then uh, the the messenger RNA is active, and translation can occur, and you can start making those proteins. Now, one final area of uh, uh, post-transcriptional regulation, actually regulation that occurs at the translation level, is a really hot topic in biology and has been for maybe 10 years or more now. This is the small non-coding RNA molecules. And in recent years, we are finding that there's not only small non-coding RNA molecules, but there are large non-coding RNA molecules. There are RNA molecules that the cell produces that can turn off translation. Uh, these RNA molecules have been dubbed miRNAs for microRNAs or siRNAs for small interfering RNAs. And if you start reading in the literature, there seems to be a little bit of a debate on the actual definition and distinction between these two. Uh, one, uh, one group of definitions that I found says siRNAs are exogenous. They come from the outside of the cell, whereas mi microRNAs are endogenous. They're produced by the cell itself and regulate the uh, translational process. Uh, there's another distinction that's made, and that's whether or not there's, com we'll get to this in just a second here, whether or not there's precise binding of this RNA to the, to the messenger RNA and whether or not it completely breaks down the messenger RNA or not. But uh, again, in, in kind of looking through this, I've seen a little bit of, um, of um, different uh, definitions for this. So, uh, but but we'll, we'll stick with the definition that I have in the outline, which is that it, the, the um, primary difference is, is the precision of the binding of this RNA to the messenger RNA. Um, but bear in mind that uh, you also see this other definition that siRNAs are primarily exogenous. They co they're coming from outside the cell. RNA interference, sometimes just called RNAi, is a phenomenon that uh, scientists have exploited in order to uh, see what happens in a cell when you turn off the translation of a particular gene. If you go into this cell and you add a small RNA molecule, the right small RNA molecule, you can actually stop translation of this particular polypeptide and therefore ask the question, 
What's that polypeptide doing? What happens to that cell when you turn off the translation of that, of that particular polypeptide? And so you can investigate gene function this way. Uh, it's a fantastic tool for doing that using RNA interference. But it turns out the cell does this normally, does this naturally with these small molecules. Now, like I said, an even newer topic than these small molecules are the large uh, non-coding RNA molecules. These microRNAs and small interfering RNAs are non-coding RNA molecules. That is, they do not code for a polypeptide. They're non-coding RNA molecules. Uh, and so they're small non-coding RNA molecules and uh, up to oh, five years ago or so, we thought that was the only kind of non-coding RNA molecules that were important in translation and now we're finding that there are some other ones too and in fact it looks like almost a, a large portion of our genome is actually translated in yeah, transcribed excuse me transcribed into RNA uh, maybe up to 80 percent of our genome is transcribed into RNA and these probably have some function in maybe regulating translation. But there's a lot, pretty good bit known now about M miRNAs and siRNAs, so let me tell you a little bit about these. Where, are they, where do they come from? What are they, they're transcribed, they're, they're RNA, so like all RNA molecules, they're transcribed from DNA somewhere in the cell. That DNA can be a variety of places. It can be in this stuff we used to call junk that's in between the genes. And maybe it's not junk, maybe there are some of these are transcribed into these small RNA molecules that affect translation. Some of the time they can come from introns. The introns we thought were always just cut out and thrown away. Well, so in some cases, some of those introns that are cut out, they may, not, they may be cut out and not make it into the final messenger RNA, but they may not be thrown away. They may actually go on and then function as uh, a, a, a small non-coding RNA that, that affects translation. Um, so wherever they come from, they're transcribed from somewhere. They're usually pretty, pretty large when they're originally produced, and they're cut down into smaller molecules by an RNase. Remember, an RNase is an enzyme that uh, cuts, that digests RNA. And so an RNase called dicer. And I, another nice name for an enzyme. Like I said, if people named enzymes like this all the time, we wouldn't have any trouble remembering their names. This one is called dicer. And so it chops up the RNA molecule. That's a pretty large RNA molecule and produces uh, a smaller RNA molecule. This RNA molecule is double-stranded. It is in the it's a fairly small RNA molecule. Here you see the diagram of one of these double-stranded miRNA molecules, one of these microRNA molecules. That molecule is then further processed into an even smaller single-stranded RNA molecule of only about 20 to 26 nucleotides in length that becomes bound to a protein called argonaut. Um, the argonaut protein binds to that small RNA and together the argonaut protein plus the RNA make up what's called risk. And you see, there you see risk on the outline. That diagram is a little misleading. Risk is pointing to the protein, but actually that protein is, is, is a primarily argonaut, but the whole structure is risk and risk stands for RNA induced silencing complex. So the argonaut protein plus this, this uh, short RNA make up the RNA silencing complex risk. That can then bind to the RNA molecule. Um, it usually binds in the three prime UTR of the RNA molecule. And if that binding is precise, base for base, all the bases match, the tendency is for that RNA molecule to be destroyed. And in that case, this has been designated an siRNA molecule. siRNA molecules, uh, according to the, tr the original definition, are those in which the pairing of the small RNA molecule is precise. You get perfect base pairing between this small siRNA molecule that's part of risk and the messenger RNA, and that stimulates the cleavage. You chop up the messenger RNA, and so that messenger RNA will never be translated. If the pairing is not precise, then you, instead of 
chopping up the RNA molecule, you simply turn off translation. But the effect is the same in both categories. Maybe in the first case, it's irreversible. You've chopped up the RNA molecule. But in both cases, you turn off translation. No translation is going to occur. So these small molecules are involved in going in and turning off translation of particular messenger RNA molecules. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, and I kind of skipped over, didn't go over any detail, these small RNA molecules can also have an effect on transcription. They can actually uh, also uh, cut off uh, trans transcription. So uh, if you understand that little diagram there and what uh, the, the, micro, the original micro RNA molecule that's double-stranded, that, that uh, starts the work is, it produ it's produced by Dicer, and then it's processed further into uh, a shorter RNA molecule that's bound to argonaut and producing the risk complex and then that binds to uh, messenger RNA and turns off translation. Uh, the reference in your textbook said a thousand miRNAs have been discovered in humans. Uh, I have a feeling that is way out of date. Uh, I, I imagine that the number of discovered uh, human microRNAs is now uh, an order of magnitude or a couple orders of magnitude greater than that by now. Uh, it's, it, they also point out that about one and a half million have been discovered in Arabidopsis. Arabidopsis is this little uh, flowering plant that's used as an experimental organism. So this is not some uh, strange, weird process of gene regulation like we saw with in uh, in paramecium or tetrahymena where you make a macronucleus and you do something really weird that only occurs in a few strange organisms. This is a process that occurs in all of our cells and it is a very important process in gene regulation. It's one that you can go back, oh, I'd say 20 years maybe, maybe a little bit more. You go back 20 years and we didn't know anything about it. Uh, there was no knowledge at all 20, 30 years ago of, of these microRNAs and, and the small interfering RNAs. And it's, it's really, um, like I've said many times, just when uh, molecular biologists think, okay, we've got everything figured out, all the theory figured out, we just now need to apply the details to all these genes, and then we'll understand what life is all about. Just about the time we get to that point, someone comes along and throws a monkey wrench in everything and says, hey, We've got uh, splicing going on. Uh, we go in and we cut out these pieces of, 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 of uh, intervening, uh, these intervening sequences in the, in the messenger RNA and throw them away. And so back in the 70s, we thought we had it all figured out and somebody said, what about, well, what the hey, splicing is going on? And so we, we had to go back and kind of rewrite the whole book. Uh, this again happened with these molecules. We thought we kind of had the mechanisms of gene regulation figured out until these molecules were discovered and now we realize uh, there's a whole nother level of the regulation of gene expression that we didn't know anything about. The importance of these small molecules is uh, can't be can't be overstated. Uh, microRNAs are active in cancer cells. Uh, there, it's, it's very definite evidence that, that cancer cells may be using microRNAs to become cancerous. And there's evidence that and and there's therapies that are trying to design microRNAs against. Uh, certain cancer cells, and so it can be used as actually a chemotherapy, a uh, very targeted chemotherapy to turn off gene expression in, in, in cancer cells. Um, uh, there's another reference there if you want to click on it. This won't be on the test related to microRNAs and their function in the immune system. And then there's this little blurb at the bottom of that outline on hunting for microRNAs. I'm not going to really test you on that when I give you this little things in green. This is kind of, you know, here's an interesting fact uh, that I don't necessarily want to test you on. But the hunt for microRNAs is a very difficult hunt. I was at a conference um, in uh, up in ski country in Colorado, and the entire week was spent uh, talking about m uh, microRNAs. And this was probably six years ago now, maybe seven years ago. And so there's been so a whole lot more discovered since then. But in talk after talk, uh, people would would stand in front of us and tell us about the hunt for microRNAs that affect a particular the production of a particular polypeptide. And they would identify some candidate 
microRNAs. How do you go about finding these genes? Well, it's very, very difficult. They're very hard to find because you, you, need, a, you need to find a segment of DNA that's maybe 20 bases long that is complementary to a piece of the three prime end of your messenger RNA, the three prime UTR of your messenger RNA. But now remember, if they're microRNAs, they don't have to match perfectly. They just have to be sort of complementary. And so in talk after talk, uh, researchers would get up there and talk about these candidate uh, microRNA genes that they had found. It said, you know, this DNA might, might be transcribed into a microRNA that affects the production of our particular polypeptide. And so then they would go through and, and test each one of those and find, does this microRNA actually, can we add it in the, in, in, uh, in the test tube and actually turn off the expression of that gene? That was the first step. And then secondly, does that really happen in life? Uh, do, is this a, a, a microRNA that the cell actually uses uh, in, in not just in the test tube, but in, in life to, to turn off the expression of the gene? So the hunt for these molecules is maybe not, not quite that easy. And finally, I want to mention one other aspect of the uh, post-trans post-transcriptional RNA processing that is, excuse me, uh, post-transcriptional regulation of gene expression. That is what happens even after translation. Uh, we could consider that if we make the regulation of gene expression definition very broad, we, consider, we could consider what happens after translation is also uh, affecting, uh, being uh, a function of, of gene expression. That is, if, if we think of gene expression as producing a functional polypeptide, then that polypeptide, once translation is done, that polypeptide may not yet be functional. It may need to be cleaved in case of insulin. Insulin has to be chopped up a little bit before it's actually the, the, the pre-proinsulin is chopped up and we'll get to this a little bit later and we end up with this short peptide uh, that's called insulin but it, it isn't functional until it's undergone this processing these processing events and so the processing that happens after translation can also be considered a part of uh, post-transcriptional gene regulation so that would include the uh, cleavage of the poly of the molecule, the proper folding it, the work of the chaperones, and we'll talk about these later too, in folding the in, in allowing the molecule to fold properly. Formation of disulfide bridges, we'll get into those, these these uh, covalent bonds that hold the uh, peptides or regions of the same polypeptide together, Addi adding different, L uh, different uh, chemicals to it, the glycosylating the protein, um, and uh, adding phosphate groups. Uh, uh, to phos the phosphorylation of protein, and even the degradation of proteins. If we think about the function of a, of a polypeptide being uh, an enzyme activity, if that enzyme is very stable, then that gene is going to be expressing itself for a long time. But if that enzyme is degraded very rapidly, then that gene is not expressing itself for, for a long time. So in the broadest sense, we can even consider uh, the, the rate of degradation of a protein as being a function of uh, as being an example of post-transcriptional regulation of gene expression. I've given you one specific example of the post-transcriptional modification of a protein, and this is not one that really falls in the category of post-transcriptional regulation. This is not the normal process of regulating the expression of a, of, of a of a gene that is whether or not the, the polypeptide is functional. But this is a post-transcriptional regulation of a particular polypeptide that is important in medicine, actually in diagnosis, and diagnosis particularly of a disease uh, like diabetes, diabetes 2, uh, the adult onset diabetes. This is the presence of a, a hemoglobin called hemoglobin A1C. This is a, an abnormal modification of a polypeptide. The hemoglobin, uh, uh, let me go back and uh, tell you a little bit about uh, diabetes, of course. Diabetes uh, involves uh, problems with, with insulin getting an insulin pro proper function, and therefore the uh, blood glucose level is too high, is elevated. Uh, and so in order to test for diabetes, you want to test blood glucose level. And the traditional, te the, the, the standard test for 
uh, diabetes is testing blood glucose level. And so you test it after fasting and you may test it uh, two hours after having a, a meal. And, uh, but the numbers are, are extremely variable. After the meal, the blood glucose level will rise, then insulin does its job, and the gluco blood glucose level drops down again. And so uh, just a one-shot test of blood glucose level may not be that informative as to whether a person has diabetes or not. It may give some false negatives and some false positives. So uh, a, no a better test was needed. The test that was developed was this hemoglobin A1C test. What was discovered was that your hemoglobin molecule actually becomes chemically modified the longer by being exposed to high glucose levels. The hemoglobin molecule uh, undergoes a process of glycation where a glucose is actually added onto the amino end of the beta chain of hemoglobin. This diagram here shows you that. There you see a hemoglobin molecule, and that hemoglobin molecule has two alpha chains and two beta chains, and there you see the amino end of the beta chain. And there is a glucose, a linear glucose molecule. That glucose molecule can actually be added uh, onto the amino end of that um, beta chain of hemoglobin. And so that molecule becomes the, that hemoglobin molecule becomes glycated. That molecule we call hemoglobin A1C, the, the molecule that has had the hemoglobin added to it. Now, hemoglobin molecule has a half-life, excuse me, a, a, a red blood cell has a half-life of about three months. So those, those uh, red blood cells in your body will last uh, at the longest well, somewhere in the neighborhood of three months, a uh, half-life of three months, but yeah, around three months is how long they're going to last. So the uh, proportion of the percent of your hemoglobin molecules that are H, HA1C molecules is a good indicator of what your average blood glucose level was. The American Diabetes Association has defined uh, diabetes as a hemoglobin A1C of greater than 48 uh, micromoles per, per mole. And that's, that's the, the indication that, the, that you have, have had too high a glucose level over the last three months. So this is a much better test because it does not rely on just the moment by moment or the, the hour by hour changing glucose levels. This will indicate the average glucose level. And if that level of uh, hemoglobin A1C is too high, then uh, it's an indication that uh, you are diabetic and need to take some action about it. So that will finish up our look at uh, uh, the regulation of gene expression.